would like for us. Okay, before, let's start again. Before we offer a blessing for this time, I would like uh, for us to take a moment of silence, a moment to acknowledge the lives that have been cut short by racism, the lives that have been harmed. Um, we know that intergenerational racism has real effects on the health of everyone who's affected. Um, and that has been also very tangible in the lives that were, have been lost recently. Of Jacob Blake, for example, um, I, I hesitate to even say a name because I know there are so many more names that I do not know. Um, recently, I found, if you are interested, uh, the Washington Post is holding a database on police shootings and um, I run out of words. Um, I run out of words. And so I invite us to take a minute. I'm going to put a stopwatch on my phone so we go for a full minute because sometimes silence can be uncomfortable. Um, but just feel what you feel in your body. What is your body bringing to this time together? Okay. One minute starting now. Thank you for joining me in that moment of silence. To offer a blessing for our time together today, may we, may wherever we are on this journey for racial justice, may all of us commit to concrete actions that support change today. May our commitment to our faith traditions and to no faith traditions. Call us and support us to that action. May we lean on those backgrounds as we do hard things together. In the many names and no names of God we pray, amen. All right, I'm going to invite Abby to take the spotlight now and talk a little about how we got to doing our fourth town hall together today. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, um, everyone, for attending this live event today. And thank you, Laura, for allowing this event to take place during your September Interfaith Council regularly scheduled meeting. So thank you for that. Um, the screens that you see on of the faces that you see currently will be the people who are speaking today. That's why we have asked them to leave their screens on, just so you know. So thank you to everyone that is not presenting that has turned their screen off. It's great to see all of your names. There's a lot of names that I've seen at previous town hall events, and there's some new names here, which always excites me. Um, so perhaps those of you, there's some of you who have attended all three town hall events that are leading up to today. And so you might be really well versed on what we're all about and what this series is for, but maybe today is the first event of the series and you're curious, how did this all start? So however you landed here today, I am really glad you're here. And I would like to give you a short history of this town hall series that began on June 19th. And um, as Laura mentioned, I work for World Wisdoms Project. So I am professionally invested, obviously, in this series. But on a personal level, I am biracial and black and white. And I have two very, very dark um, black children. 
and three biracial children. And so um, I am invested on a personal level as well and on a spiritual level in the work of anti-racism and racial equity. So just a little background about me personally. And then as Laura said earlier, this series is done in collaboration um, with the Fort Collins Interfaith, Interfaith Council. So World Wisdoms Project and the FCIC together. And we are really just, if you don't know much about us, we're two nonprofit organizations that are focused on creating a better Northern Colorado community, harnessing each other's differences and similarities to unify the community. And that is our hope through this series. Um, the series was birthed from an existing relationship and partnership between our organization and a shared desire to have a sustained and deepened conversation about race, privilege, white supremacy, and how to make Northern Colorado and our nation a more equitable and healing community for all. So our first town hall event took place on June 14th. It was hosted by Reverend David Williams, Reverend Laura Nelson, and Rabbi Hillel Katzir, with the focus being listen. So attendees were invited to listen to 10 brave and vulnerable Black, Indigenous, and people of color in Northern Colorado who shared their personal stories of racism and racial inequity in this area. Following the listening event of Town Hall 1, we had Town Hall 2 on July 2nd with the theme of process. It was focused on white privilege. So this processing session was led by John Henderson, the Assistant Dean and of Students and Director of Parent and Family Programs at Colorado State University. John helped us explore whiteness and better understand how it shows up in both our personal life and in our community. He very humbly and authentically shared his, his experiences of waking up to whiteness and he led us in a series of prompts to help us awaken as well. After listening to local community voices of color process whiteness and white privilege, hear their stories of racism, we went into Town Hall 3, which took us into a deep dive of the roots of white privilege. So this session, which occurred on July 19th, was led by Professor Janine Hill Fletcher at Fordham University. Deneen authored a book called The Sin of White Supremacy, Christianity, Racism, and Religious Diversity in America. She helped us understand our history by sharing the religious and legislative moments that have led us to where we are today, recognizing that white supremacy is built into our nation's history. During this session, the audience broke into small groups where we were, we were able to discuss our personal, familial, and institutional histories of how white privilege has affected us. We also discussed ways in which we have or could be an agent of change, which leads us to today. So the first, through our first three town hall sessions, we've offered the community of Northern Colorado an opportunity to listen to people of color, to process white privilege, to deepen our understanding of the roots of white privilege in our nation, and our final event today, which you are here for, will focus on activism, how to make Northern Colorado and our nation a more equitable healing community for all. So today we are passing the mic to organizations in our community that are working towards racial equity in Northern Colorado. Our desire is that you become aware of the work towards racial equity and anti-racism already being done in our community by these organizations and that you learn how to support them in advancing their mission and vision to create a more equitable community. So we're glad you're here, whether you've been to all three events or this is your first event. And I'm just gonna pass the mic back to Laura before we start interviewing our presenters. Oh, that was fast. Thank you, Abby. Um, oh, it's just been such a gift to work with World Wisdoms Project, um yeah such a gift uh and before we started one thing that we wanted to do was just talk a little bit about no let me restart uh to there's um to use this word allyship to talk a little bit about what we hope um especially white identified folks might do uh as a response to this gathering um 
I'm trying to remember, and as I was reflecting on what I was going to say during this time, I've been trying to remember when I heard the term ally used in the way it's being used around racial justice for the first time. But what I have noticed in myself and also sometimes across social media is that those of us who identify as white uh, sometimes use the term ally toward, sort of this self-identify to say we're reading the books and maybe having some arguments with uh, folks in our families, but maybe not doing actually doing that much. And that's really why we used the word for this fourth town hall, activate. Um, if we want to be allies for racial justice, we need to be doing things. And that can be on a, I'm knocking things over here. That can be on a really wide scale of what you are doing, but we need to be donating, volunteering, showing up for actions. We need to be using our advocacy and our power to call those who are in leadership to work for racial justice. Um, I'm looking at my notes here next to uh, the Zoom. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that one, we're not doing this alone, and two, we are not necessarily the leaders of this work. We don't need, know what needs to change because many of us benefit enough, so much from those structures that keep racism in place that we don't know what the problems are. Also, as long as there has been racism in this country, there have been people working for racial justice. So it is not our job to start things. It is our job to join things, to join in the work already happening. And that's evidenced by the many leaders. And this is not even the full list of organizations that uh, we contacted um, who are working on racial justice in Fort Collins right now and have been for a while. Uh, so I hope that uh, from this gathering, you'll be inspired to do something concrete, to maybe get to know an organization you don't already know, or to deepen your relationship with an organization you already know. Uh, later, after all the presentations, we're going to send you a Google form. This will, for those of you who are at down, town hall number two, it'll be very similar. Um, we'll invite you to fill out a Google form that is your naming of a commitment to doing something concrete after this gathering. And what I hope is that you will commit to doing something concrete that you can follow through with. These are extraordinary times. There are extraordinary limits on people's lives in ways that maybe there haven't been before, but all of us can do something and should do something. And I, that's why you're here. So I hope that you take this time here to get ready to do something again. And it just becomes that doing the next right thing. Um, and this becomes a step on your journey. So with that, I am going to mute and turn off my video and hand things back to Abby. Thank you again. Well said, Laura, thank you. So in the vein of the word extraordinary, I am honored to present six extraordinary people today and this work that they are doing towards racial justice and equity in Fort Collins. So the way that this is going to work is um, each speaker, each presenter will have about seven minutes to share about their organization. So they're going to give a short kind of presentation about what they do and how to get involved. And while they are speaking, if you have questions, you can utilize the chat function. It's a private chat that will go directly to Laura Nelson. And these questions we will um, look at as soon as the presenter is done speaking. So feel free during, while any of these presentations are going on, if you have a question, just use the chat function, ask it, and we will try to address them after each speaker. And then after each of the six speakers have presented, we will have some time before we fill out the commitment form to answer and ask any additional or follow-up questions. So this is really a time to get to know these organizations and ways in which you can support their work through monetary donations, through volunteering, and through um, other ways. So without further ado, I guess I'll begin. Our first um, presenter today representing Diverse Fort Collins is Catherine Valdez. Diverse Fort Collins Founder Catherine is a former newspaper reporter and nonprofit communications director. 
who has lived in Fort Collins since 2002. Catherine was born and raised in Los Angeles. She is an award-winning writer whose latest essay was nominated for a Pushcart Prize and was published in Rise, an anthology of change, which won the Colorado Book Award for Anthology Collection. Catherine has summited 65 Colorado 13ers and 14ers and dozens, other, do, and dozens of other peaks around the West. So, Catherine, are you there? You can take the mic now. Thank you. I was waiting to be unmuted. Oh, you good morning. Know. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to Fort Collins Interfaith Council and World Wisdoms Project for hosting this opportunity for our community to learn uh, about just of a few of the many great organizations here in town who are working for racial justice. I'm Catherine Valdez. I'm the founder and executive director of DiverseFortCollins.com. It's a volunteer driven community project connecting people with resources and each other. And we launched last year in 2019. And the idea was to give people one website where you could go to find other organizations in town, resources, and to get involved and expand your social circles um, to have friends of many different cultures, identities, and abilities. So I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I came here in 2002. And in 2015, I joined my workplaces equity and inclusion team. It was newly formed and I realized um, after re attending the uh, multicultural community retreat hosted by the city and local nonprofits that um, before that I realized, you know, all my friends here are white and I was um, usually the only person of color in my workplace. And so I just really wanted um, a way to connect with other people. And I know many other people wanted that also. So that's how Diverse Fort Con was born. We started, um, and I have some slides to show if um, um, Gaurav would be so kind as to um, show that. Um, we have a website, diverseforcons.com, and the idea is to create an inclusive community, um, co-create an inclusive community. Um, we started out in the spring with a discussion of Robin D'Angelo's workshop in um, Boulder, Seeing the Racial Water. As you, most of you know, Robin D'Angelo wrote White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. We had a discussion uh, with people who had attended her workshop and those who wanted to hear about it. Um, so that was a great discussion at a local restaurant, Maza Kebab. And then we um, developed the website and in November of 2019, hosted a book discussion on um, uh, the House of Broken Angels by Luis Alberto Urea and had our discussion a week before the Fort Collins Reads event when he came to uh, Fort Collins to discuss his book. And so after we hosted a three meeting discussion on white fragility by Robin D'Angelo in January, February, and then because of COVID, post COVID postponed um, to May and uh, held that online, there were people who we were so surprised um, at the first meeting that nearly 45 people showed up at Wolverine um, Farm Letterpress and Public House. And we had to overflow to the upstairs space. Um, we were so pleased and surprised to see so many caring community members want to learn together and make new friends and talk about um, white fragility, white supremacy, um, institutional and structural structural racism and how to dismantle that, how to talk about it. And so we were pleased that many people after that um, discussion series wanted to take action. And so a uh, next slide, please. So we decided to start working on a diverse Fort Collins action committee, which our volunteers, Victoria and Amanda are leading um, to launch very soon in the next month or so. We're gonna be um, 
letting the community know about information ses sessions about our action committee and volunteers Teresa, Karen and Mia are helping me launch the advisory committee. Um, next slide please. So there will be many opportunities for our community members to get involved and the idea is to collaborate. As Laura said, um, there are already many great organizations out there. We would like to collaborate with them um, and help bring volunteers to existing efforts for re voter registration um, and dismantling um, structural racism. So this is a screenshot of our website where we offer resources and links to local nonprofits, um, businesses owned by people of color, people of um, different identities and abilities, uh, voter registration information and links, a little bit about the history of Fort Collins, news and events and how to donate. And that welcome mes message goes into more detail about how diverse Fort Collins started and I want to say how grateful I am to all of the volunteers who have uh, worked with me to facilitate small group um, breakout rooms in the book discussions, which meet about every other month. Um, our biggest event was in late June with the um, panel talking it out being black in America featuring three black community members who talked about their experiences and the national um, events in the wake of the murder of George Floyd um, by police and many others. And so again, we had people who wanted to take action. We're really grateful to those three guest speakers, um, Phil Donaldson, Anthony McGlawn, and Saja Butler, who shared their experiences. And Anthony and Saja um, performed um, uh, a couple of songs and that was really great um, and inspiring also. We had 80 attendees at that um, event, online event, and we're looking forward to meeting more, making new friends, uh, welcoming community members who want to learn and listen and um, uh, go on this journey with us um, in as safe a space as we can create to have discussions and answer questions, um, help each other answer questions. Um, as I said, we've been focused on awareness and education up to, up to this point, um, but we're ready to move into action. We have about uh, 12 to 15 active volunteers now and about 25 or 30 who are interested and we welcome more. Um, so if you'd like uh, the next slide, please. And um, as Abby mentioned, I have um, a personal interest in this. My mom is from the Philippines. My dad was born in Roswell, New Mexico and grew up in East LA. And um, on that side of the family, I'm of, uh, of Sioux, Comanche and Tarahumara descent. And um, as many of the characters in the novel There There by Tommy Orange um, mentioned, I don't know a lot about um, that part of the family heritage. And so reading that novel and discussing it with um, diverse Fort Collins um, volunteers and um, book group discussion members, it was really um, a great um, education and um, very helpful to read about um, the perspectives of many other people. Our upcoming events are in October. Uh, October 4th, we're going to discuss The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, and which will kick off with a 10-minute talk by Judge Juan, v, v, um, Juan G. Villasenor, um, Larimer County's first Latino um, district court judge. And so we're looking forward to that. And then another three um, discussion series, three meeting series in January, February, and March discussing So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Oluo. And we're looking forward to that. Um, Old Firehouse Books is so um, great to offer 20% discounts on paperbacks for um, book groups that register with them. So now you can, right now, you can order a copy of The Color of Law from Old Firehouse and pick that up for 20% discount. And starting October 4th, you'll be able to um, buy So You Want to Talk About Race um, from Old Firehouse for that dis discount. 
And so we, we do welcome volunteers. Um, we're going to announce on our website and in social media um, about um, volunteer opportunities and welcome volunteers, donations. Um, please don't hesitate to email diversefoco at gmail.com. Uh, visit our website and contact us to get involved. And um, with that, I'd like to, um, again, thank everyone um, who's uh, participating in this town hall today. And I will welcome answering your questions. And you can, um, oh, and advance to the next slide, please. And that'll show the links. We have these opportunities coming up and then links of how to get in touch with us. If you type your email in the follow box um, at diverseforcons.com, you can be among the first to read about news and uh, event announcements. So thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. This is Abby. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that presentation. Thank you for your work. Um, Thank you for staying in the area and not leaving as we had had a prior conversation about a lot of um, people in the minority culture due to this community and the lack of diversity um, leave the area because it's just not comfortable on multiple levels and the inequity is, is loud to many. And so thank you for staying. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for inviting us in um, with you. And um, it's just been a joy on a personal level to get to know you over the past few weeks. So, Catherine, I'm Thank you. one. You're Thank welcome. you, Abby, and I, you also. And I just want to mention we, um, the community resp response has been so um, great. We have more than 500 followers on Facebook and nearly 600 followers of our website and the blog post updates. So there is this desire, um, as we've all seen, a desire to um, educate ourselves and to reach out and to um, take action. It's, it's, it's so awesome. So I want to let um, everyone who's watching know that we will send a follow-up email with all of these links. So you don't need to be writing them down right now. If you don't want to, you can just sit and watch and listen and let it soak into your soul and your mind, the work that's being done. So again, we will, we will send a follow-up email with the links that each organization is sharing today on how to get involved um, and how to contact them. So Catherine, I'm wondering, I would like to just ask one question before we move on to our next speaker. Is there a specific local issue facing our community that you would like to see advocacy work on? For instance, um, affordable housing, criminal justice. Is there something that you, a specific local issue that you would like to see more advocacy work on? I think there are several. I mean, there are so many. Um, I, if um, you haven't heard, um, this is the first time in 28 years that the district attorney's race has been contested. And um, I would encourage everyone to va vote all the down ballot races, look up um, the candidates um, such as Gordon, um, the two candidates, um, Gordon McLaughlin is a Democratic candidate. And you'll see from his website that there um, is a lot um, that he wants to do about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so, so number one is the upcoming election. Um, volunteer, get involved in voter registration and volunteering for, volunteering for local um, state and federal races. And yes, affordable housing, of course, is one of the top issues in our community. And I would say, um, take a look at the resources page of our website. Um, we have links um, to many of the organizations, um, uh, to the organizations that are um, speaking today and to many others. Um, so take a look, do some research um, and reach out, get involved and attend our book discussions. And we'd be glad to talk more with anyone who would like to um, learn more. Thank you so much. Hey, Laura, I actually, I think she just checked off. Okay, if you, um, if the audience, if you guys have questions, please continue to put them in the chat and we will address them after all six presenters have gone. So let's just, um, even though Catherine can't see us, let's just send her our thanks. 
and our gratitude for her work with Diverse Folk Co. And let's just take about 10 seconds to let this settle in with us. Um, again, write any questions you want before we move on to our next speaker. So thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. All right, well, we are going to move on to our next organization, which is La Familia, the Family Center, um, with their representative, Odalis Fernandez. So I am happy to introduce Odalis. She has worked at La Familia, or the Family Center, for over two years. She works as the bilingual administrative assistant and helps with all programs um, at the Family Center, La Familia. Before working there, she attended Colorado State University, go Rams, and graduated with a, a degree in human development and family studies. So here we go, Odalis Fernandez, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, of course, thank you for having me and thank you all for coming and um, listening to this. I think this is a really important um, town hall and subject that we should all be engaging in. And so as Abby said, my name is Odalis Fernandez and I work at the Family Center La Familia as the bilingual administrative assistant. And so basically, or if in case you are all curious, we are located off of North College and Hickory Street, kind of by Old Town. Um, and so basically to get started, we were founded in 1995 by a group of community members who wanted to create a local family resource center here in Fort Collins. And so for those of you that don't know, the Family Center La Familia is half a family resource center and half a child care center. And so when we were first founded, we were just a family resource center because we saw that there was a need for um, just a center to help the community. Um, but then it was about five years after we were founded that we added the child care aspect to our center. And so that was around 2000 where we added child care um, because they also saw that there was a need for more affordable child care in Fort Collins. And so um, looking at our mission and values, our mission is Working alongside diverse families, we provide high quality child care and supportive services with an emphasis on cultural attunement with the Latinx community. Uh, this work is done with an explicit vision of creating a community in which all families are safe, supported, and thriving. So um, I'd also like to make a comment that while we do have a focus or emphasis on the Latinx community or the Spanish speaking community, just because there's not a lot of resources out there for them, um, we offer our services and programs to anyone and everyone in the community or in Larimer County that um, is in need of any of our services, they're more than welcome to come and access them. And so our values, we have six values and they're kind of tied in with our mission, but our values are trust, compassion, diversity, equity, inclusion, and love. And so I'll only touch on a few of them, the ones that are more related to the purpose of this town hall. So with diversity, we want um, non-dominant cultures, identities, perspectives, and experiences to be celebrated and embraced. Um, so we want to provide a place or a space for that to happen. With equity, um, we see that the structural, cultural, and relational inequities in experienced by oppressed groups must be courageously recognized and dismantled. We find that really important and try to also include that in the work that we do here at the Family Center. And finally, with inclusion, we strongly believe that all people should feel welcomed, valued, and empowered to contribute to and participate in our community. So we find those um, really important and when we are trying to find what classes to have, what programming, anything work related here at the Family Center, we try to strive it towards or relate it to our mission and values since we all strongly believe in that and we try to make sure we are showing that through our work in the community. And so basically, um, if I were to think about a story or two that 
of our organization having a positive impact on our community. I could honestly go on forever. We, I believe we have very strong staff that tries their best to have the most positive impact on our community. Um, but one that comes to mind would be with our Mi Voz program. And so Mi Voz is a mobile home park advocacy group. Um, and we see that there is a strong Spanish speaking population and community in mobile home parks. Um, and specifically, a, uh, something that Mivos took part in was when the Fort Collins City Council voted in favor of protective zoning for mobile home parks. And so after more than six months of work by Mivos resident leaders and the Family Center staff, there were two options presented. So option A was um, exclusively protects mobile home parks and accessory uses within them. And option B that would allow for other forms of more affordable housing. And so um, with all that work being done, they voted in favor of the protective zoning for mobile home parks, which is a huge victory for them. And they, Mivos had been a part of this process from the beginning by helping residents with writing emails, mobilizing their communities, speaking at the council and making videos in favor of their perspective. Since Mivos has a goal of making the solution, the community solutions um, like resident led. So Mivos doesn't, they basically help support them and give them the resources so that the residents are the ones doing the work and putting in the effort to see some changes in their community. So, um, so it's really all the residents really doing the work. And so in this, the people sent in recorded testim testimonies, which had never been done in council history. There were videos of them showing their homes and families for more of that personal touch. And interpretation was provided at the council meeting, which um, that was really important because um, as one of our values is inclusion, um, a simple thing as in having interpretation at these events is really big, just so that all people in the community can feel included, understand what's happening, and so that they can, they're able to participate because a lot of the times there's barriers of not understanding or just not having interpretation at events can really, um, I guess, not allow for certain populations or communities to be able to attend. So having something as simple as interpretation was really big. So that's a big victory and um, positive impact on the community. And we also have our family strengthening team. They really helped in uh, during these times of COVID, really helped navigate families through this crisis. And they helped tremendously with many things such as providing backpacks for children right now that they were gonna start online school. Um, they helped provide rental assistance since many people were left without no jobs um, and with utility assistance since that was something that people were also not able to pay in these past few months. So the FSS team has really pushed through and um, helped the, all the families in need in Fort Collins. And um, with ways to get involved, really, um, here at the Family Center, we are, uh, donations help us a lot. If you go on our website, there is a donation tab. And with that, you can give a one-time donation or um, monthly donations. Uh, we also accept donations of hygiene products, and this is really big and we greatly appreciate any product or hygiene products, such as shampoo, bars of soap, toothpaste, conditioner, body wash, lotion, anything like that, because we have a closet in which people are able to come once a month and get up to three items. And sometimes our closet is pretty low on items, and so, being able to have our closet stocked with these is really helpful for the um, family members that can't even um, afford to buy basic hygiene products for their families. So that is a, a really big donation that we take in. And finally, with volunteer work, right now we're still trying to see 
um, with everything with COVID happening, our programming has changed, but we are looking into more of group projects. So if you all have a group of people that are interested in putting their time into an organization like the Family Center, you can um, email us or contact us um, to see what kind of projects we have going on. Um, something maybe on the weekend for a few hours or in the evening, something um, just because right now we're not um, we're kind of strict on allowing people into our building or visitors, but we are um, looking into more group projects. So um, that is all with the Family Center. And yeah, thank you. And if there's any questions, I can be glad to answer those. Odalis, thank you so much. That's a lot of information in a short time. So thank you for presenting it to us. And I do want to encourage everyone to just check out the websites after the event today because there's just so much more that she didn't even have time to mention. I just wanna summarize that um, La Familia has been around, as you can see on the screen, for 25 years. So they've been offering services to the community for 25 years. And one thing that I found really interesting is that um, it says that 30% of the staff at La Familia are native speakers and 50% are bilingual. So I think that's really, really impressive and beautiful. And um, yeah, and then just a recap also that there, there are three so like pillars of service are early childhood education, family support services, and leadership and advocacy. So thank you very much, Odalis. I think due to time, we're gonna get to our next person and then at the very end, we will um, respond to some questions. Does that sound good? Yep, that's great. Okay, thank you. So again, I just want to take about 30 seconds to um, just thank Odalis, to, for us to sit with the work of La Familia, um, to write down any questions, to send them in the comment section if you have any questions right now that we can answer at the end. So I'm going to give us about 20 seconds of silence and then we will move on. Thank you so much. All right, we will now move on to our third organization, the BIPOC Alliance, Black Indigenous People of Color is what BIPOC stands for. I am pleased to introduce Andrew Naves um, to our event today. Andrew is a Colorado native and just a one year resident of Fort Collins. He worked in construction and the service industry before he was pulled towards social, social justice work following the murder of George Floyd. Andrew now works as one of the founders of BIPOC Alliance here in Fort Collins. So I will turn the mic over to you. Welcome, Andrew. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Abby. Um, uh, I am Andrew Naves one of the founders of the BIPOC Alliance. Um, again, thank you, Abby and Laura and World Wisdoms Project and Fort Collins Interfaith Council for inviting me to, do, inviting me to introduce the BIPOC Alliance. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, to the other organizations here for your contributions to community. Uh, BIPOC Alliance formed as a group of friends grieving over the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we looked at the problem of policing and how intrinsically the broader systemic issues contributed to those problems. Um, we know that passionate Black, Indigenous, and people of color have been fighting for centuries against the oppression of their peoples. And my co-founders have been working for decades here in Fort Collins. Uh, but we need, realized that we needed to do more together to make a bigger impact. It is our vision that Black, Indigenous, and people of color will have autonomy and power over our own lives and futures. Our collective joys, gifts, stories, and cultural and ancestral practices are the life force that weaves our communities together. We can and will be our whole selves without fear of state sanctions and institutionalized violence. 
and white supremacy must be abolished on all fronts. Collectively, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color of Larimer County are taking action to decolonize systems and institutions, redefine our relationship to social movements across the board, and liberate ourselves and our people. We are dedicated to building trusting relationships and a mutual support network between BIPOC-led groups and organizations with aligned values. One of the lasting scars of colonialism is the pitting of black and brown against each other. Fighting amongst ourselves and competing for scarce resources has often allowed the broader structures that burden all of us to escape unaddressed. We need to have clear alignment and commun communication with each other to fight the institutionalized racism that affects all of us. With our efforts together, we can magnify and amplify our voices to more powerfully and efficiently affect systemic change. So we want to be the organization organizers. We want to help existing BIPOC groups with shared interests work together and provide other services and advocacy that makes sense for a broader coalition of BIPOC. There are many BIPOC groups in Fort Collins doing tremendous work. Some fantastic organizations speaking here with us today. But often these groups are working for siloed communities. So instead of duplicating efforts and competing for finite institutional generosity, we can focus on addressing, addressing issues that affect the lives of all BIPOC. School resource officers disproportionately targeting children of color. Uh, the Fort Collins city budgets al allocation of funding for education, low-income housing, policing, transportation, and utilities. Creating a youth group that embraces cultural and ancestral practices and is gender inclusive. Working to have local politicians and policymakers embrace and publicly endorse platforms and policies that improve the lives of BIPOC. Creating a white solidarity group to help foster, organize, fundraise, and educate allies. And working to provide free access to mental health services by, by, by BIPOC providers specializing in racial and ancestral trauma to help begin the much needed healing. If you would like to get involved and we can use all the help we can get, please visit our website, uh, bipocalliance.org. Here you will find more information about what we believe our engagement form if you would like to offer support, and links to our social media pages where, which are much more actively updated with what we are doing and how you can participate. Uh, of all the ways that you can participate, we do need money. Our donation link is on our website. Um, we are not a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, instead, we have a fiscal partnership with the Foothills Unitarian Church. Uh, this allows us to use their 501c3 status, but also gives us more freedom to support our communities without some of the rigid structures that are remnants from colonialism. Uh, we are passionate about providing BIPOC remuneration for the work that we do, and we need money to do that. Researchers, educators, those who are writing the curriculum for our youth group, administrators, and speakers are among many others who need to be paid for their labor. Also, please consider becoming part of our White Solidarity Group. Uh, this group is really taking on a huge lift, organizing, mobilizing, and educating white allies. Uh, you can do this by filling out our engagement form on our website. Um, of our more time-sensitive efforts, we have a few things coming up, all of which will be on our social media. Uh, but one thing is coming, one big thing is coming up this month. Uh, we and our research team are combing through the 2021 Fort Collins budget proposed just this Tuesday. Uh, we will post our findings on the budget items that uh, will impact the lives of BIPOC on our social media. But we will need people to show up for the city's two public comment sessions to voice support for our proposed changes and to let the city council know that BIPOC lives matter and that the issues that impact 
the lives of black, indigenous, and people of color, have the passionate support of the whole community and of registered voters. The first public hearing is September 15th. And on our uh, social media, we will have links to the proposed budget itself and our recommended changes, explanations, and the links to those uh, public hearings when they are released. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for giving us some concrete ways to support your organization. And um, uh, as someone who's been in Fort Collins a little bit longer than you, welcome to Fort Collins. I'm really glad that you're here and that you and Johanna and Queen founded BIPOC Alliance. Um, so thank you very much. And again, just due to time, we will probably move on to the next presenter and then answer questions at the end. But you gave us a really thorough explanation of your organization and ways to help. So Andrew, thank you. Um, from the 87 uh, participants right now, we wanna say thank you as well. And thank you for bringing up the white solidarity group because I'm assuming that many of our participants are white here today and are wondering um, about that group. So. You can find more information about their, their six areas of focus on their website, and that includes the White Solidarity Group. And then their Get Involved form is it's intense in a great way. So it, it filters through how you can help, the ways that you can help. So I encourage you to um, click on that Get Involved tab and look at their form. So Andrew, thank you. And we will just take, again, a 20-second pause just to sit with this and in gratitude and um, again, type in any questions into the chat function that you may have. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Mary. All right, as we move on today, first I wanna say thank you to our presenters to sticking to the seven minute allotted time. It's a very small amount of time to get to know you and your organization. So thank you for that. We are moving along quite nicely and um, I am really pleased to introduce the Northern Colorado Intertribal Powwow Association. I was actually first aware of this organization when I was at the community Northside Ozatlan Center last year and saw a powwow taking place that my kids and I, we didn't participate in, but we got to see and observe from afar and um, did a little more research and follow up. And so I'm really glad today to have one of their representatives, Meg Bonahum. And Meg, I'm gonna ask you, um, in your bio it says you are Mexican and then two other Indian tribes that I feel like I'm not going to say their names correctly. Would you go ahead and say you are Comanche and Tlaquaquan? Um, that was a good try. <laughs> <laughs> Comanche and Tlaxcalan. Tlaxcalan okay. is a tribe in Mexico. Okay, great. Okay, so <laughs> thank you, Meg. And although um, white people think Meg is white, she has never felt white and has happily spent much of her life running around in black and brown cultures. Meg did not grow up with Mexican or native cultures, but was introduced to a powwow in her adult years when living in the Midwest. This gave Meg an avenue to connect with her ancestry. She moved to Fort Collins in 1988 and found the Denver March powwow, one of the largest in the country. She then came across the Northern Colorado Intertribal Powwow Association and jumped right in to help. She has spent time as treasurer and vendor coordinator and is currently the vice chairman. Because of Meg's involvement, she has been blessed to have family through the group and to be involved with the Colorado Native community in many other ways. One highlight she said was getting to attend the release of the Pure American Bison Soapstone Prairie. So without further ado, I will pass the mic to you, Meg. Thank you for being here today. 
Thanks, Abby. So, all right, I had to write some things out on this. Um, so the, the uh, we call it INSEPA. It's easier to say than Northern Colorado and Tri Intertribal Powwow Association. And we started 28 years ago as a group of native people and uh, non-native people who were interested in native culture. And I joined shortly after that. There are a couple of us uh, from the original years still left. And NSEPA was founded with the intent to celebrate and share Native American heritage. And interestingly, we run across now and then this um, idea that Native people were killed off. And even though there was a big attempt to do that, we're still here. So we're, we're trying to keep everybody in the Native world is, is working to keep our cultures alive and to support Native people. Uh, we are now kind of scattered around, but um, NSEPA is here to support the elders, to inspire our children and our youth. So one of the ways we do this, and one of our, our actually our biggest activity is our annual powwow. And if you have never been to a powwow, you are missing something really wonderful. It is a, it's a community event. Everybody is welcome. We have learned in the last couple of years that people have, aren't sure that they can attend the powwow. It is a public event and we welcome other people. One of our purposes is to educate people about Indian culture and the powwow is one of the, the very good ways to do that. And when you come to the powwow, there is, there's dancing and there is singing, which of course involves the drum. The drum is sacred to native people. Um, we have great food, we have community, we have giveaways, we have honoring of uh, people in the community, et cetera. Um, visiting with each other, <laughs> again, it, it's very community oriented. We always have intertribal dancing where everybody is welcome to come out on the floor and dance. We simply ask that people do it in a respectful manner. Recognize our cultures and be respectful. Oh, and I have to mention, the vendors because I am the vendor coordinator and have been for years. Um, wonderful people and they come and they sell really great things. Uh, unfortunately this last spring we had to cancel our powwow due to the pandemic but we are very much hoping next spring we'll be able to be back functioning. So a couple other things we do are uh, Christmas time we do a food and gift drive aimed at the native community. Um, there are a number of native people in the Northern Colorado area, and some of them are, um, what's the word I want? They're not necessarily poor, but they, they struggle. And so we want to help. So we do a food and gift drive every Christmas and we have a, a party, we all get together and um, have food. Food is big in the native community. <laughs> Um, so, um, and we have some games and we have some singing and some dancing and uh, then people go home with, with gifts and, um, food as needed. And we have over the, um, over the years, our members have been invited to many schools, university events, festivals, um, Girl Scout, Boy Scout, celebrations, other events to share our Native American culture through singing, dancing, and storytelling. Singing and dancing is very important, again, within the Native community, along with the storytelling. And our dancers and singers are usually available to do these presentations, depending, of course, on people's work and, and school schedules. And, um, Again, we just request that people are treated like any other professional that you invite to your school or your event and offer them an honorarium. Okay, let's see, what else? Um, oh, one other thing we've been doing is um, urging 
our Native people to uh, register on the 2020 census. This is very important. It's really important for all people of color. We need to be represented uh, on the census. And it's very simple and it's confidential, but these numbers end up counting for programs and transportation and uh, school resources and all kinds of things. So this is something we've been promoting for us, particularly for native people, but this is uh, also important for people of color. Um, oh yes, our impact has gone beyond our local native people. Although it's certainly been a blessing to have our these activities in Northern Colorado. And I'd like to just point out that the students at CSU Native students also put on a powwow each year. So there's, there's opportunities here. Um, but we know that we have also impacted other people, people who have come to our powwows and, and who have like, Abby came and said, oh, it was great. <laughs> um, let's see, oh yes, so we do, um, we currently aren't being active. Um, we will again come about October, November, start ramping up for our Christmas uh, giving activity. But we all always welcome people. We welcome people of all backgrounds, all cultures, all races. We just ask you come in with respect for native cultures. Um, when we put on the powwow, it takes a lot of people. It's it's quite a large event actually. <laughs> so we very much welcome help at the powwow. We welcome help leading up to the powwow, uh, making plans, um, finding donations, etc. Speaking of donations, we um, do welcome donations. If you go to our website, you can click on, um, what is that tab? Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay, maybe it's like we'll, it's send them, up. we'll send there it them. We'll send them. Contact. If you click on the contact tab, you will see this, and you can just simply donate to us. You can go to smile.amazon, and uh, then your purchases help us out. Volunteering, again, some of the help we can use is people who know where to get help of the sort, where um, grants, donations from various places. We have uh, really all kinds of functions that we can use volunteers for. I think one more thing, Abby, um, we were going to have that clip of Tiny yeah. Tots. Let me give you a little explanation real quick. This is uh, something from the powwow and we encourage our children, of course, to learn dancing and culture and etc. And so we have a tiny tot competition and we get our little ones out on the floor and every one of them gets a little prize at the end. Fruit, a dollar, etc. <laughs> And, and I just would like to add, for Native people, the drum is the heartbeat. And if you got that rhythm, you can see that's, that's the heartbeat. And, um, and there are beautiful children out there learning the, the Native culture. Thank you, Meg. We hope along with you that the powwow can take place in spring of 2021. 
and um, thank you for your time. I'm glad that you were able to connect with your ancestry yeah. in the late 80s and that you were able to come to Fort Collins and get involved. And um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the, the past few weeks. And I really encourage people to reach out to you and to look at the website for ways, specific ways, concrete ways um, that you can help the, what did you call it again? Nick, Nick, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and Sipa. <laughs> so, Meg, thank you very much. If you are able to hang on till the end of the event, sure. um, if people have questions, that would be great. And let's just take again about 20 seconds. Thank you to send our thanks to Meg. And um, any questions you want to send in the chat? And Sipa, thank you, Gaurav. And um, then we will move on. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. You bet. All right, everyone, we only have two organizations left to hear from today, and it's my pleasure to um, introduce Queen from the organization New Eyes Village. So Queen has lived in Fort Collins for 12 years and is a single grandparent raising a young family. She and her family's experiences of injustices and oppressive behavior through persons and systems has given birth to a confident black nonprofit organization here in town called New Eyes Village that has ultimately, through God's grace, as Queen says, caused a chain reaction of black owned and led organizations and soon to be nonprofits. Queen is a sitting member of many things. So she is a sitting member of the Early Childhood Council of Larimer County, its Public Policy Committee, PSC School Accountability Committee and the District Accountability Board representing her children's elementary school, Laurel Elementary. Queen co-chairs with her son, Donovan Johnson, the Healthy Larimer Committee, which is, an, which is an advisory board to the Board of Health. She is also a member of the State Advisory Board of the Family Voice Council, where they advise the state's Colorado Department of Human Services agencies how to be more equitable and diverse for the families they serve. Queen is grateful that the nonprofit she founded, New Eyes Village, has been able to support families where they are at regardless to the best of their ability. Queen, I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, Abby. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful to be here, honestly. Thank you so much for um, the Interfaith Council and World Wisdom Project for inviting New Eyes Village to be here. Um, as you heard, um, I've lived here for 12 years. Um, my nonprofit was born out of, uh, I guess, what's the word? Um, Self-preservation. Um, like you've heard, we have suffered some different injustices here through the schools and different nonprofits. Um, and I felt like if it was happening to me, it was probably happening to other Black families here as well. So No Eyes Village is pretty much a nonprofit for the people. Um, even though we focus on families, on Black families, we have found that white bodies have been able to come inside of our organization and support us. We don't, help is such an ugly word. <laughs> Please don't help us. That's actually a book, you should get it. Um, but we do like the support. Um, going back to the beginning, I, I lived here. I went through a lot of trauma in my personal life. I looked to God and the church to save me, and he did. Um, I started off at Genesis Project Church with Pastor Rob um, and Pastor Mark. We lived there as a homeless family through the FFH program. 
along with some other churches as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. I was saved at Heart um, Genesis Project. Um, unfortunately, I felt like I was, it was an uncomfortable situation because being a black woman, when you talk about God, I like to hoop and holler and put my hands up, snap my fingers and, you know, I feel it, I feel it. And I feel like um, it was making a lot of people uncomfortable. Uh, Pastor Rob gave me his blessings to leave the church and follow my dream of becoming a pastor and having my own church. So one of the churches we lived at was Heart of the Rockies. And I was actually an employee there. I did housekeeping there for three years. And I went to Pastor Melissa and I said, I need space. And I need a space where Black families can come and fall on the floor and sing with their children and cook collard greens and don't offend nobody. And she sat with her board and they let it happen. Um, I sat down with an associate pastor. We did a, a MOU and Pastor Melissa in Heart of the Rockies Church and they showed me to be the first equitable church here in town. Um, they allowed me space to let families and children come in. We had up until 50 families. We cooked and we sang and we have evening events. And it was great. Um, unfortunately, COVID happened. So there are some phases that we're going through right now. But going back to it, we're a nonprofit for the people. We do focus on Black families, but we have found that a lot of white body people were able to come alongside us and learn some things about who they are and about what it is to be vulnerable. Um, unfortunately, they've lost a lot of friends in the process, but they understand what is right. The impact that we have on families are the small processes that we're able to push through New Eyes Village, one of them being my son's youth program called YEAH, Youth Engage in Arts and Academics. We've had a small organization give us some space. Families are allowed to come here, do remote learning with their children. Um, our parents feel encouraged. Their self-esteem is high because they can engage their children while they do their work. They can go into another room and be certified through the state with certain trainings. And it's all seven generation work, not second gen, but seven generation work. Um, you know, slavery hurt all of us, all nations of people. And unfortunately, um, our Black community, we're not free. There are a lot of systems that are still holding us back. And as far as volunteering, it would be great if we can get volunteering and donations. So spatial justice is health equity. We have, um, how can I say this? There are families that are privileged here in town or families that are privileged that you guys know that may have a small piece of land that you can actually donate to my charitable nonprofit and actually write it off opposed to the city coming to take it or buying it and doing something else with it, allow these families to grow food, heal with each other, be amongst each other. So when we have unfortunate incidents like, like what we've been going through in this country, there's a space for us to go to and we can heal with each other and we can talk amongst each other. I have five sons. They have nowhere to go right now besides with each other. And sometimes it, it's not pretty. So donations, um, money works well, financial donations, as we care for families' rent, we take care of their car notes, we help children in the school pipeline the prison system because we know that that's real, and their families going back and forth to Denver to visit children Financial help is always good. 
furniture as families are moving into homes. We can always use furniture and storage because as families are unfortunately being evicted because their husbands or mothers are being put in jail, we need somewhere to put that furniture as well because they're losing it. I'm down to about 15 seconds. Um, yeah, oh, and please keep your fingers crossed as my organization just put in a huge grant with Larimer County for a mental health, behavioral health facility. Yes, that's what we're doing. We're actually trying to put a mental health facility for Black and BIPOC community members here in Larimer County. So if I can get all of my believers to get together, put a prayer out for me so we can make this work, it would be great. Better community members, better community. Thank you so much for being here and hearing me out. I'm grateful to you all. Thank you, Queen. I love, I've said this before, but I love your energy. It's so contagious. <laughs> You've gone through so much and you're still going through a lot and your energy is amazing. So thank you for the energy that you bring to Fort Collins, the work that you're doing. And we encourage you to visit the New Eyes Village website. Again, we will send that link. Um, the link after this event. And just to summarize, uh, New Eyes Village is a faith-based, grassroots, nonprofit organization founded to support the self-sufficiency of marginalized families in areas of mental health services, financial literacy, and wellness while collaborating with our community. So thank you very much, Queen. All right, so let's take again about 20 seconds and then we will move on to our final presenter. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat session, chat section so we can revisit them after our final speaker. All right, thanks, Queen. All right, everyone, our final nonprofit of the day is the Fort Collins International Center. And I am happy to introduce Lisa Bogdansky. She's gonna have to correct me on her last name, but Lisa is a Colorado native married with two children who are both international adoptees. She has been here with the Fort Collins International Center for the last 14 years and is now the past president of the organization. Her interest in working with the international population at CSU stems from serving 26 years with the United States Air Force and working with various cultures around the world. She is accustomed to traveling to locations, not knowing the language and wondering what's next. She feels that she can relate to the students and maybe more so their parents and often asks herself, if my child were in a situation, how would I want them to be received or what could I do to help out? Ooh, I love that. If, if my child were in a situation, how would I want them to be received or what could I do to help out? Beautiful. So Lisa, I would like to pass the mic to you and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Ooh, I'm um, thank you for the invitation is that the Fort Collins International Center has been around basically since 1948 and we became a 501c3 50 years ago. So we've been around but people don't really know us that much and we are here to support the international community at Colorado State University and also to incorporate them into the community of Fort Collins and the whole area around Fort Collins. And to let Fort Collins know that there are cultures and people out there that they don't have to be afraid of. Um, a lot of times, a lot of our 
when I first started, go back on a story, is that when I first started this, it's one of our programs, it's a friendship program, where we connect students with individuals out in the community. And at that time, we would get applications from the community saying, yes, I want to have a student, this is what I'm interested in. And then at the bottom, it would say, please, do not assign me a student from this country, which I really took offense at. Uh, because of my background. So that's why I like getting into what we do because our basic mission statement is understanding knowledge and friendship. Um, you have to understand the cultures around you. You have to have knowledge of the cultures around you. And you know what? Everyone needs a friend, no matter what you do or where, where you come from. Uh, and that's, that's us in, in just the nutshells, the, the knowledge and understanding, and especially in, in this day and age where you don't know what's going to be behind the next door. So anyway, I, we do have a little bit of a PowerPoint that we use. It's, we use it for the new international students that come into the university, but it also gives us um, a way to reach out to you all that, and everything that we do. And this year, because of COVID, all, quite a few of our programs have had to be curtailed because they're one-on-one, -on -one, face to face programs. So we have used Zoom, and if I were smart and saw into the future, I would have invested in Zoom a long time ago. Made a lot of money. Um, so anyway, our, our uh, I, can, I can barely read this. Our different, our, we have various programs that do involve students, do involve community. And, Okay, I think next slide, kind of overslept. Okay, come on, next slide, Gaurav. Gaurav, Gaurav your technical guy is one of our volunteers. Um, the Global Ambassador Program is that we work with the, with the uh, Poudre School District and anyone else who is nearby that we can drive to to, to get students. And we, they request various countries, you know, like you have people who come speak to us about China, you have people who come and talk to us about India. Um, and we drive these students out to these areas and the students themselves, we uh, average about 2000 school students through the Poudre School District that we go out and talk to throughout the year. Once again, this is something that we've had to curtail a bit. Hopefully we can get something going through Zoom with the school districts with their international days to help once again carry the different cultures out to the students. Uh, it's very, very active. So anyway, next slide. And we'll get there. Next slide. International Night at the Library is one we've had to kind of cut back on because once again it's one-on-one. -on -one. But what we do is they're, they're, I call it armchair traveling, is we have people in the community who are interested, they want to know what's going on in the world, but they can't travel or they don't travel for whatever reason. And we know people who have traveled, so we put together a program with the Pooter Library. Uh, where people can, you know, they come in, they see the, the photographs, they see, you know, hands on, talk, ask questions, and, and a, a presentation on various um, countries around the world. In fact, the last one was Bali. I'm trying to think. It was, it was, it was a strange combination with like Austria and Bali. But we're doing that with Zoom through the uh, Pooter Library, and people can go to the Pooter Library calendar and sign up and get the invitation so they can listen to that so they can understand and know what's going on in the world a bit more okay next okay okay we did that one okay volunteer support is our volunteer coordinator volunteer support this is where we really work closely with the community because like i said we support the international population the international population comes here with a suitcase or two, and that's all they've got. Um, they come with their families sometimes. They need uh, baby things, you know, like cribs, furniture, uh, baby seats. Uh, we do get diapers on occasion. 
we have other things that people need to, to set up apartments because they need to set up an apartment and they they've just landed here and you know a stranger in a strange land also if someone needs to move and be gone for a little while we can provide some storage for them we can provide transportation to and from the airport um, other international logistics uh, helping out we've had we we have uh, actually taught some people how to drive. We help students uh, who have children with disabilities. Uh, past year or so, we've had a couple of students with autism who need a, needed assistance in the public school districts. So we have volunteers that, that help and direct people into, into different, uh, I, you know, how they can best support their families and we support them. Uh, and also our volunteer support takes uh, volunteer applications. If you want to volunteer with this, you can, we will have that on our, our website that you can click on. Um, okay, next. Um, international, okay. I can't see it. I think this is the, uh, I can't see what this is. I'm sorry, Lisa. They're having a little bit of trouble, obviously, with the clarity of this. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, you're doing a great job while they're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I can't, I, I can't see around myself here. Uh, door to door. Okay. I, I really can't read that. But we work with. God, what is it? Oh, oh, international friends. Okay, because I couldn't see the word friends. I thought international what? Um, international friends. This is where the community members apply for and they want to be a friend with an international student or staff member at the university. Uh, our only requirement is you meet with them once a month during the academic year. Uh, whether it's coffee, it's home, you know, home, home meals, taking them to your kids' basketball games, uh, school plays, whatever, introducing them into the American culture so that they can understand and we can kind of understand them a little bit more. This is the only opportunity a lot of them will have to see an American home and interact with American families. Um, it's very active and we are still taking applications to connect students however once again it's 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 through the technical world through zoom through duo through whatever is out there that you can reach out and you can support these students uh, friendships have been made in the past that people are still getting wedding invitations um, announcements for children and these are uh, announcements that go on forever and ever and in fact, I was, I was in Germany a couple of years ago and I mentioned Fort Collins and this woman just perked up and she was from the Philippines and she's like, oh, do you know? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, well, I remember going to, and this is, you know, like 40 years in the past. So we do connect with, with families and, and friends that direction. Um, next, I'm trying to get through this. We've got a lot of programs going on here. Next slide, International Women's Club. And this is nothing to throw a rock at men, but this is just for women. Uh, when we do it in person, it's just for women because we have a lot of religious considerations where there are women who cannot be in the same room with, with men who are not a family member. Um, and it just makes life a little bit easier. Uh, we do, are doing it now on Zoom every Friday. In fact, the leader of this group is, is calling in every Friday from Romania. And Adina takes everybody through whatever problems they're going through. They, they share, everybody shares recipes. They share the, the ups and downs, you know, the childbirth, new babies, you know, just pregnancy, just day-to-day -day living. Here's our culture. Here's our, act, you know, these are our holidays. This is what we do for our holidays. Um, and it's just women sharing with women. And they, they are growing you know, every year they've gotten bigger and bigger. So it, it, it is a great women's support and women from the public, from the public, from the community also join in. And we have several older women who actually is grandmas. They go to these meetings and they hold the babies. They love holding the babies and they help out, you know, as much as they can, the, you know, the older women to the younger women. And 
so the, yeah, it's very community involved with that one. Uh, next. Next, next, next. Conversational English. This is one that is ongoing and is active, and it's through Zoom again. And it meets on Mondays and on Thursdays. Uh, it's open to anybody in the community as well as the internationals on campus, uh, their families, the students. If you know, so like, like my hairdresser, his wife has just come to this country. Well, you know, we're open to, to her coming to join. Uh, to learn, excuse me, get more comfortable with the English language. And through that, we also have customs and, and just sharing once again, what is important to people and how it works. So that is, you know, we always use people from the community for volunteers, for conversational partners to assist once again, when somebody needs assistance uh, out there in the international community. Uh, next, I think we're almost done. Okay, these are two programs that have definitely been put on hold. Uh, the Friday Afternoon Club is last Friday after of the month that we meet at one of the university locations for a community potluck and we share meals, we share stories. Everybody gets together and it's it's really kind of fun when you look around and you see, you know, the the, the, the new students coming in, going to the older members of the community to say, oh, we want to practice our English and just, you know, sharing, uh, sharing of foods and customs once again. Uh, and of course, because it involves food and face-to-face, -face, we can't do that right now. And we're hoping within the next year we can. For the outdoors program, where we work with introducing uh, the international population to what you can do in and around Colorado. Uh, some have never seen snow before, and we have an international, you know, we have ski days, we have hiking. Um, just involvement, getting people outdoors and getting away from studying for a little bit, that there's something beyond studying. And that's, once again, we go to the community and say, can you help us get these students out and about? Can you help us escort? Uh, but those two programs, we've had to put on hold until such time as we can get back together again. And next. Next, next. There we are. Um, we have our website which has applications, it has descriptions of all of our programs. It tells you how you can uh, volunteer, where we need volunteers. If you want to join up in a class, you want to join up in the women's club, um, all the connections are right there at our website with the world's largest website address. Um, and we are, we are here on Facebook. We have two Facebook pages. We've got Instagram. Uh, we're, we're trying to modernize and get out there. We're a bunch of old people who want new people to join us. Um, and we're just, we're just here for everybody. And our, our big fundraiser of the year where we really need a community, and we probably might not have it this year, is the World Unity Fair, which takes place at the university. And our part of that is the International Bazaar, which is like an international garage sale. And we take donations of anything. If, you know, Aunt Margaret traveled someplace 25 years ago, sent you a gift, and you're like, well, what do I do with this? Well, you know what? We'll take it. <laughs> so we, we are here for the university population. We are trying to educate the people in and around Larimer County and Fort Collins that there are different cultures out there, and you don't have to be afraid of somebody just because they don't speak your language or they don't look like you. They are like you when you get down below the skin, below the language. You're you're looking at your family. So, but thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for um, for powering through a little bit of a blurry PowerPoint. And everyone <laughs> else who has been watching too, thank you very much. I do have to say I have a friend who's uh, personally invested in the International Friends Program, and it has been life changing for her and for her family. And so um, volunteering and assisting and supporting these organizations often changes us in the process. And that's one of the best parts about it. So thank you for sharing about that, Lisa. And I do wanna say, just highlight and celebrate the longevity of the Fort Collins International Center. They have really been doing work for 70 years in the area. And that is something 
to be celebrated. So thank you, Lisa. Um, I would love if all of our presenters could turn their screens on right now. The present, I think they're all still here. So, so that everyone can be seen. Thank you. And then everyone who is um, attending and participating and watching, could you turn your screens on too so they can see everyone who's present and so that we can give them an ASL. Thank you, applause or um, some snaps. So we'll take a minute. If you are an attendee and could take a minute to turn on your screen, that would be great. Yay, it's so good. Yeah, keep it up. Just, we really wanna thank everyone here, those who are here to listen and learn and those who are here to share about the work that they are invested in. So you six presenters, please just take in this thanks and gratitude from all of us for your work. And hopefully you'll be hearing from many of us um, after this event. So really quickly, because we don't have much time, Laura, are there any last questions that we would like to ask that people have submitted that you think we need to cover before we move on to the commitment form so that we can hear from our attendees? Oh boy. There were some fantastic questions in the comments and I also want to respect everyone's time, especially our presenters. Um, I am wondering, one of the things we're gonna do that's different from these, the other town halls is post this on our websites and social media and I'm wondering if you are willing to maybe answer questions in the comments, presenters. Um, some of the themes that came up was concern for international students and for those who uh, do not have the privilege of U.S. citizenship at this time, and uh, the work, the way the work gets more challenging. Um, so those those were some of the realms of questions. Um, but I'm wondering if, for the sake of time, you might be willing to answer those through Facebook or something like that. I think that's a great idea, Laura, as I will be sending out a follow-up email with contact information for all of these organizations. So if you have a specific question for an organization, you will get information on how to contact that organization. And they hopefully have time to respond. Is that, yeah, I agree with that, Laura. Well, um, if everyone can hang on, since we only have about 13 minutes left, um, Laura, would you like to introduce the commitment form that will be in the chat section? Absolutely. Um, so Gaurav is going to copy and paste a Google form into the chat. It is something that worked really well for us uh, when we did, some, did our reflecting on white privilege in town hall number two. Uh, and what we're asking all, oh, we're, we're losing people, but we're asking you all to commit to one thing based on what you've learned today or other organizations you know about. Oh, and there's the commitment form. Um, it also has a spot where we're asking your permission to share your commitment. We don't have to share your name, but just to be able to start sharing the kinds of things that people are being inspired to do. And if um, you can copy and paste the link in a different browser, it will help avoid you getting knocked off this Zoom call. So if you just copy that link and open it in another browser, then you will be able to stay on both the Zoom call and you can see um, this commitment form. Sorry, Laura, just wanted to interject nope. that. <laughs> <laughs> that is fine. And what we had committed to do, and I hope you'll stay, I see people already heading out, but I hope you'll stay. Uh, and give it a few minutes and we will start uh, reading responses from people who give their permission. So we're gonna give it two or three minutes and then we'll start reading responses.
Great job filling out the form. I see 14 responses so far. So you guys are doing it correctly. Thank you. Okay, friends, we are at about two minutes and um, I'm gonna start by sharing a commitment from me with Interfaith Council. Uh, I was moved and challenged uh, by Adalis and, our, and looking at uh, is Interfaith Council as accessible as it could be. So I'm going to look into both closed captioning and what translation looks like for Zoom uh, to see if we can make our meetings more accessible. Uh, so that's commitment number one. Other ones I am reading are to join the BIPOC Alliance White Support Group, to contact and interact with New Eyes Village, uh, join the diverse Fort Collins e book discussion groups. We've got a specific donation commitment, a donation commitment for hygiene products. Oh, Queen is showing us the color of law book and all her post-its. Um, let's see. Oh, we have, um, every time you all post a new thing on the form, it puts me back to the top and then amazing things. Um, there's someone who wants to talk to the current police chief about racism, about founding the, of the police department and the systemic racism that's a part of that. Let's see. Another person who wants to work on fair housing. Abby, jump in if you're seeing things that you want to Yeah, add. it's moving quickly too. Right when I'm about to say it, you say it. So good way to stay on top of it. <laughs> All right. I'm seeing someone who wants to get involved in youth programming to promote oneness. Um, a commitment to check out each of the websites from today's speakers and share this information with this person's church, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I see two commitments around en enabling voter registration, um, mm. getting people to vote. I'm seeing a commitment that says they would like to educate their community about the resources presented here for Northern Colorado and continue the work they are currently already doing with their congregation to educate them on white body supremacy. Someone else has said they have committed, they are working toward developing a diversified youth and junior youth group active in service projects for the community. Mm -hmm. We're also getting some coming through the chat, um, a commitment to be a part of the color of law discussion, um, and another to move a congregation towards more impactive connection towards racial justice. These are wonderful. Just so you guys know, we will leave this um, commitment form open if you weren't, if you needed to think a little bit longer and let this sit more deeply, um, or after you research these organizations, you say, this is exactly what I'm going to do. We would love for you to share that with us. This mm -hmm. is very, very encouraging. Um, and just as a reminder, the work of anti-racism is life, it's lifelong, social justice, racial justice, so these are just one step that we are choosing to take and, and it will be steps every minute of every hour of every day, but it's nice to see some concrete action that are taking place. So I think Laura, we might wanna move on. We only have five minutes left. Absolutely. So Abby, do you wanna start with uh, your World Wisdoms Project event is next? Sure. So camp. I so this was the final event of Town Hall Four, like I had mentioned earlier. So this entire or, or the entire Town Hall series. So although we are done with this particular series, um, World Wisdoms Project, the theme for this upcoming year, and we run our year uh, concurrent with the academic school year. So we're just beginning our new year, and the theme is spiritual practice in time of crisis. So um, we are. 
looking into shared spiritual practices that can contribute to long lasting racial, social, and environmental justice issues. So we know there's a lot going on socially, racially, in the environment. So our programming is seeking to look into spiritual practices that can sustain us and unify us, ways in which they inform us to take action. So Barb, if you have the P or the JPEG of the up of our upcoming event that will take place in September, that would be great. Um, but we do have an event. All of our events this year will be online. We have six events. They will all be via the Zoom platform. And our first event is September 23rd, which is a Wednesday evening. And Garav, our tech volunteer, is actually one of the panelists at the event. So the title of it is Living Spiritually, Spiritual Practice Informing Social Justice. So our panelists will be Garav Parche, Sue Kenny, who is a founding staff member of the City of Fort Collins Master Naturalist Program, John Kafalis, the Larimer County Commissioner, and Dr. Larry Keith, who is a medical doctor, retired OBGYN, who does work in both Fort Collins and Kenya. And I'm sorry, I don't know why this is blurry, but there should be a registration link in the chat section. I will also send one out in a follow-up email. Um, if you would like to register for this event. So again, our theme for the entire year is spiritual practice in a time of crisis. So um, we would love to have you as we continue on the work of justice. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Abby. And Garav, when you're ready, you can move on to the more basic picture, our next Interfaith Council's next meeting is going to be Thursday, October 1st. I always get nervous. We meet the first Thursday of the month. I always get nervous when it's on the first day of the month as well. Um, it is our annual grants and awards conversation. Um, we will be giving out about $4,000 in grants to, um, in a new style, to organizations that are bringing people together across differences. Um, we're really excited to share those with you. Um, and as it is with many things, we have committed now to do Zoom through the end of the year, uh, but this event was perhaps the one that we wondered the most about how to do online. So surprises to come. I hope you'll be there. And if not, I hope you'll look forward to the uh, projects that are gonna be created by the grants that we're able to give. Um, let's see, I think that's it for our for interfaith council announcements um often during our monthly meetings we invite announcements we are out of time so if you email ft collins interfaith at gmail.com um let's see if amy's here she can toss that into the let's see we can toss that into the chat um that is how you can put something up on our e-newsletter which comes out around the 15th of the month um Yes, and so that's a great way to get more information, calls for donations, all of those things. Um, and let's see, it's the Interfaith Council's tradition to have the board meet right after the meeting, so executive team, check your email for the link. Uh, oh my gosh, and I am just, I'm so grateful for all of you. So grateful to, for the commitments you are making, so grateful for the work you've already done. Um, I think you've seen by the breadth of organizations and work that we've heard from today. If you have a passion already around justice or working for peace and connection, which you all do because you're here, there is a way to work for racial justice within that framework. And I hope that you do. Uh, so thank you all so much for your time this morning, for the time that you will be spending later. And I hope to see many of you in October or at uh, the World Wisdoms Project September gathering. Peace and blessings to all of you. Thank you.